Okay. Welcome everybody to the 2021 virtual conference for NAFEX, North American Fruit Explorers. Uh, our conference title, as you probably know, is Fruit Forward, Growing for Tomorrow. And thank you, thank you for joining us today. My name is Chris Mannix, and I'm a volunteer board member with NAFEX. And I'll be serving as a facilitator today for this session entitled Giants of Pawpaw and Persimmon Breeding Past and Present. Before I introduce today's panel, I'd like to share with you a couple of housekeeping items and a little bit about NAFEX as we allow a few more people to join in. So first, this is a webinar. Uh, and unlike a normal Zoom meeting, participants audio and video are turned off automatically. Second, we encourage you to ask questions. Really, ask questions. Um, and you can use the Q&A tab uh, down at the bottom there to ask topical questions, or maybe you need technical support from our co-host, Eric Bina. And then third, if you're newer to Zoom, you can adjust your screen view and a whole bunch of other settings on your device. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to members and conference goers at nafex.org. And uh, just, just a few words about NAFEX. So NAFEX was founded in uh, 1967 and is a network of individuals throughout the United States and Canada devoted to the discovery, cultivation, and appreciation of superior varieties of fruits and nuts. Although the ranks of our membership include professional palmologists, nursery owners, commercial orchardists, NAFEX members are all amateurs in the true sense of the word and motivated by their love of fine fruit. NAFEX members share ideas, information, experience of fruit propagation material via our website, social media channels, fruit, fruit specific interest group meetings and annual conferences like this one whether in person or online or both. As a paid NAFEX member, you'll get four editions of the Pomona Journal each year, as well as the ability to search 50 years of Pomonas in our digital library, uh, thanks to Taylor Nelson, our vice president. And those contain a whole wealth of growing information. And if you haven't gone to there, you should check it out, use the search feature. Uh, there's tons of great content. This organization exists because of fruit growing members like you. And we encourage you to continue your membership, but also become actively involved um, as either as an interest group chair, a committee member, or even a board member. Please visit our website to learn more at nafex.org. So anyway, it's my pleasure now to introduce today's speakers. Uh, first, we'll be joined by Darren Bender Bogard of Brambleberry Farm in Paoli, Indiana, and also Buzz Ferber of Perfect Circle Farm in Berlin, Vermont. And so let me, let me introduce these guys together since they'll be speaking in tandem. Darren and his wife, Esprit, run Brambleberry Farm, a plant nursery located in southern Indiana that focuses on disease-resistant and regionally appropriate species and cultivars of fruits, nuts, and berry plants. He has found himself smack in the heart of American persimmon country and has been avidly collecting, propagating, and learning about many new and old cultivars from a handful of accomplished breeders of this incredible fruit. A side quest of his is to search for the per perfect bazaar, and I'm sure he'll talk about what that is. Buzz Ferber owns and operates Perfect Circle Farm in Northern Vermont. He propagates and sells a wide variety of fruit and nut trees. As a young man, he studied horticulture and landscape design at the feet of his father and later served as a research associate for the study critical natural areas of Delaware. He has worked 30 years as a consultant to farming operations at every scale to design and develop on-farm composting as appropriate technology at Perfect Circle Farm, Buzz says he has killed untold thousands of nut and fruit tree, tree seedlings in the quest for zone four hardiness. Gratefully, he has had many successes too. Buzz currently serves on the board of directors of the Northern Nut Growers Association. 
his quote unquote day job is as a general contractor, designing and building homes and doing major, major renovations to existing buildings. He hopes to quote unquote retire into full-time farming very soon. And you can visit Buzz at www.perfectcircle.farm. So uh, without any other delays, uh, Darren Buzz, it's all yours. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. All right, I'm gonna pull up um, our background slides here and then we'll get started, everybody. Okay. Okay, put a PowerPoint here. All right, nice little glowing slice of uh, non astringent persimmon, gyrotype persimmon here. Just love that picture. All right, well, we're going to get started and start by talking about persimmons. Uh, we have, as you can imagine, we had trouble packing all the information into an hour and a half. We're going to do our best to uh, tell you what we know, and hopefully we can get to some of your questions as well. Persimmons are uh, all in the genus Diosporos, which means divine fruit or pair of the gods. And one of the common features of all persimmons is that they are very highly concentrated in carbohydrates. Uh, some sources claim that persimmons have the second highest caloric value uh, per weight of any true tree fruits besides the avocado. Uh, full of simple sugars that are easily digested. Uh, they also have lots of fiber and vitamins A, B, and C, as well as uh, minerals like potassium, magnesium, copper, and phosphorus. Some of the little antioxidants they have are lycopene, lutein, zeanthin, zeaxanthin, and cryptoxanthin. Most persimmon fruits, uh, they need to be fully ripe before you eat them uh, due to tannins in the fruit that change in solubility as the fruit ripens. Eating an underripe persimmon is a very memorable experience that most people don't forget. <clears throat> Since the high tannin content gives you a very extreme cotton mouth feel for a long time till it wears off. Uh, there are non-astringent cultivars of Asian persimmons that can be eaten while still crisp without experiencing any astringency. And move on to species of persimmons of the temperate species. There are a number of tropical species, uh, but we're only talking about the ones that grow in temperate regions right now, and only a few of those at that. Uh, Diosporos lotus is an Asian species of persimmon. Uh, it is used pretty much as a rootstock in the U.S. for persimmon growing and just in the southern region because it's only hardy in zones six to nine. The growth habit is very similar to American persimmon, which we'll hear about in a second. Uh, it can grow up to 90 feet tall. Um, it is known as the date plum because it has very small and but really sweet fruits. Remind you of a date. Um, I've eaten them before and they're delicious, but very small. Uh, Diosporus rhombifolia is another Asian species that is more shrubby, grows to 20 feet the most, uh, multi stemmed, uh, has very colorful and small fruits, and it is used almost primarily as a bonsai. Uh, specimen and somewhat of an ornamental in the U.S. Now onto the two major species that we'll be concerned with here. Diosporos khaki is the Asian species, Asian persimmon, and it is widely cultivated. It's probably the most uh, highly bred and cultivated uh, species. Um, it's been worked with for thousands of years and has probably the highest quality and diversity of fresh eating fruit um, of all the persimmons. Uh, generally, they are 90 chromosome or hexaploid. Um, there are some variations in that, uh, but it can cross with 90 chromosome uh, American persimmons. And we'll talk about the hybrids in a second here too. Uh, there are astringent and non-astringent types of khaki persimmons. Uh, and there's also complex intermediates of this, like they're called pollen pollination variant, non-astringent, pollination variant, astringent types. Uh, 
uh, and they have to do with whether or not a fruit is right uh, pollinated, it will change whether it's astringent or not. And it can also make like an attractive brown and very sweet flavor. Uh, khaki persimmons are smaller trees than lotus and uh, the date plum and American persimmons, um, up to about 30 feet generally. And normally we say they're zone seven to 10, USDA zone seven to 10, um, though we have had success in here in 6B with a number of cultivars, so. And then the last species we'll be talking about is uh, Diosporos virginiana, which is the American persimmon. Uh, this one has a wide natural range throughout the eastern and central United States, and there are regionally distinct variants. Um, we're still learning and understanding these, but generally what we know uh, so far are that 60 chromosome types are tetraploid, are generally uh, in the south of the Ohio River region, and generally north of the Ohio, uh, Ohio River are the 90 chromosome types which are hexaploid, just like the khaki we were talking about. And these two are supposedly sexually incompatible. They cannot cross with each other. There are known, quote, seedless cultivars um, of American, American persimmon. And these are generally ones that are able to produce fruit without compatible pollen. They're perthena carpic and being grown in the opposite region of its native range. So in our area where we have generally 90 chromosome persimmons, if we plant a 60 chromosome type, such as I think Myers seedless and Ennis are both known, supposedly 60 chromosome types, um, we grow those here and they don't have any seeds in them. The fruit's a little small, but there's no seeds. Uh, American persimmon fruit has a wide diversity of colors, shapes, sizes, and ripening times but it's always an astringent type. Uh, as far as I know, there are no non-astringent American persimmons. And uh, American persimmons are typically dioecious, having male flowers on you know, one individual and female flowers on another individual tree. But as we'll hear later, there are, um, there are a lot of sort of sexual deviants from this norm uh, in Virginiana types, uh, such as fruiting males, hermaphrodites, and lots of other sort of in-betweens. Uh, the Virginian, Virginiana reaches up to 80 feet, um, but some 60 chromosome types are reported to get as tall as 115 feet in certain regions. Um, so 90 chromosomes are also most, much shorter. Generally, they're hardy to the USDA zones four through nine. And I'm gonna let Buzz take it over here. I don't know, are we are we fielding one question between our switches? No, I think we're just gonna no. say that at the end. All right, take it away, Buzz. Hello, and welcome everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I can, Perfect, I, Buzz. Oh, no video though, huh? Mm -mm. I uh, I'm sorry, can you guys see me? I'm sorry. Yeah. No okay. problem. Just go ahead um, if I can see you great. fine. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Darren, for that great introduction. And welcome to everyone who's here. Um, my section I'm going to talk about next is the, um, the history of the cultivation and breeding of the uh, American persimmon, specifically along with the hybrids. Um, we did, Darren and I both put a lot of um, photographs and documents online uh, in the section of resources that go along with this. I would encourage all of you to take a look. There's all kinds of very interesting stuff and photographs that won't be covered uh, in this talk necessarily because the persimmon topic is huge. So um, uh, to, start, to start this section of um, cultivation, uh, Darren and I both agree and feel very strongly that a lot of the work that is being done right now with uh, improvement of the American persimmon especially, uh, is a throwback to the work of the indigenous peoples before us who were selecting, breeding and planting Virginiana for perhaps thousands of years prior to the Europeans coming here. Um, when Europeans got here, a lot of that work was lost, stolen and destroyed. Um, it's very likely that the wide variation we see already in size, color, uh, shape, sweetness, ripening time, et cetera, um, is all from that work that was done 
uh, prior to us understanding what persimmons were and um, the work that was done before us. Uh, this is also similar to many other tree species. Uh, the rest of the information on the breeding of this presentation is, is basically the European people like ourselves trying to, to uh, rescue the remaining work and catch back up with the original breeding done by those people, those indigenous plant scientists. The in, uh, late 19th century, uh, we start seeing written records of uh, persimmons. Um, and these are, these are referred to as the old fashioned cultivars that most of them, many of them, most of them came from uh, Indiana and Kansas. Um, these were mostly regional favorite trees found by local people. Um, Professor James Troop from Purdue University in the 1890s, 1895 or so, and O.M. Hadley created a research station in Danville, Indiana, with these early cultivars such as Daniel Boone, Early Bearing, Early Golden, we'll hear a lot more about Early Golden going forward, Golden Gem, Hicks, Kansas, Shoto, and Smeech. Um, many of these varieties have been lost, but we do have some of them still existing. And at the same time, there was also a Kansas experimental station uh, for persimmons as well. In 1920s, John Hershey, uh, along with Russell Smith and other early members of the NNGA, the Northern Nut Growers Association, started collecting and propagating, and pro quite frankly, probably breeding uh, persimmons and other species uh, at John Hershey's his now his somewhat famous nursery uh, in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, and also at the Tennessee Valley Authority Agroforestry Plantings. The Tennessee Valley Authority Agroforestry Plantings was a program of the New Deal put in place by Franklin Roosevelt, specifically to benefit farmers uh, through the use of tree crops. John Talbot of Linton, Indiana, ran a nursery that propagated persimmons among other species, many people in, of Southern Indiana and other areas purchased and improved seedless seedling and grafted trees from him in the, in the 50s through the 70s. Professor J.C. McDaniels started collecting and breeding persimmons as a horticultural professional at the University of Illinois in Champaign, Urbana. In the 40s and 50s, he began that work. Uh, James Claypool of St. Elmo, Illinois, jumped into the breeding and research work with persimmons by joining up with uh, McDaniels in 1959. Claypool had been a student of McDaniels as an undergraduate student, and he continued McDaniels' work after McDaniels had passed. Besides being the source of many favorite cultivars being propagated today, Claypool was instrumental in figuring out many of the facets of the sexual spectrum of the American persimmon, including the discovery of 60 and 90 chromosome regional divisions. He also discovered that early golden and its progeny often sport male flowers on female trees, making them hermaphrodites to a certain degree. And from these hermaphroditic crosses, there were many, uh, self, many self crosses and out crosses. And the interesting thing when you work with hermaphroditic trees, most of the crosses from the progeny of those trees, if they're self to themselves or their close progeny, they all produce or almost all produce female seedlings. So from that clay pool was able to get all kinds of different crosses, plant the seeds and know that they would be female. And, and in that way, he propagated many, many trees that we're familiar with today. Claypool's orchard at its peak probably had 2,500 or more uh, crosses that he was experimenting with. And some of the commonly propagated cultivars that are still remaining from Claypool's work are H63A, H118, A118, H69A, I90, I94, J59, and D28, um, and many others. Claypool's nursery is now called Claypool, the Claypool Jennings Nursery. It's still in existence. There's still wood gets cut there and gets shared. Uh, it is open to the public, I believe. I don't know if there's an appointment or what it is. And it is in, uh, it's in St. Elmo, Illinois. And it's a fantastic place that I can't wait to go see in person. Um, John Gordon of Amherst, New York, did breeding and selecting out of the work of George Slate 
who was working for the Geneva Experimental Station. Geneva Long, Geneva Red, Proc, Sucus, and Geneva Pumpkin are some of Gordon's favorites that are still a common varieties today. Um, at this point, I'm gonna give it back to Darren, who's going to move us a little into the modern times, a little more modern times, and talk about some of the modern growers that are still alive or just barely have left us. Darren? All right, thank you, Buzz. Okay, and here's where I feel like I come in. Uh, this is my whole introduction to persimmons was by um, an amazing man named Donald Compton, who lives just 20 minutes south of me in the town of Valine, Indiana. And Donald was um, a contemporary of, well, I guess he, he overlapped with Claypool, with James Claypool, and was very interested in Claypool's work and uh, had just acquired land and um, was looking to get into nursery and tree crops um, and spent, according to Donald, he spent any time he had free time, he would drive over to two, uh, two to three hour drive to St. Elmo, Illinois, where Claypool was located and just walk and talk Claypool. And he said he knew Claypool would always be around. He said he never had to call head. He knew he would always be there. And I've heard many stories about Claypool over the, over the years from Donald and um, just really um, enjoy learning the history from him. Well, Donald, um, Don has a, an amazing orchard and he um, made many hand crosses of specific male and female trees um, front that he got from Claypool and some other sources. Uh, he planted out, um, planted out the resulting seedlings from all these crosses, as well as um, a number of, a, a nice collection of grafted cultivars into his uh, seven acre orchard uh, in the 1990s. Um, Don has continued, uh, well, he, he's kind of had a focus on, just like Claypool, I'm guessing he got this somewhat from Claypool, a, a real interest in the, the sort of sexual features of the persimmon uh, species that we're talking about. Um, and so he has continued to explore um, crossing the hermaphroditic uh, flowers to each other and um, with early golden progeny specifically and watching what happens. And he's found some really interesting things about shapes of the seeds. Uh, you saw a slide earlier, hopefully, that showed a little taco shaped seed, a little kind of wedge shape, and some of them had some little striations on them. Uh, he's found that certain crosses will make certain types of seeds uh, from his work. Um, Donald also has a um, a interesting work. He isolated the male portion of a mosaic uh, chimera or chimera called uh, Sucus, which is a known cultivar that uh, John Gordon brought to light um, a while ago. But it has been a really interesting plant that has performed differently for different people. And Sucus sometimes becomes more of a male plant, sometimes more of a female. And Donald found out that he could isolate different parts of it and they would stay male or female. He still has um, a grafted isolated male in his place. Um, but for those of us that have been to Donald's Orchard, he has some of the most fantastic breeding work and crosses that we've seen in, in many different persimmon orchards. Uh, particularly his Miller crosses. He has just, just some amazingly uh, beautiful fruit. Um, here's some his rose I'm going to right now in the dormant season. Um, here's some blue fruits. And um, anyway, uh, Donald just has some great varieties and Buzz and me and a number of other people have been trying to get his varieties out to the world because he's not the kind of person who's going to be just bragging on himself and you know, pretending he's the best and everything, but we all know that he's pretty far up there and a great person. So um, some of the some of the varieties that are getting out there are um, D and he all the varieties he wants to have his initials D E C Donald E Compton to kind of mark that those are his varieties. Uh, so D E C wannabes one two and three. There's D E C Goliath, um, D E C moneymaker. 
and a few others that we're, we're starting to graft and um, get out to the world. Another interesting small project, Don has a little block of hybrid persimmons that he, um, he back crossed some of the common hybrids, uh, Rosa Yanka and Nikita's gift back to some of his American males and um, has planted those out. And some of those are coming into fruition and have some really nice fruits on them. So hopefully they will be a source of some uh, hybrid material to get out to the world. And James, one last interesting thing about Donald is that uh, he, James Claypool gave Donald at the end of his, uh, I guess, productive life, um, gave his very last breeding efforts, the seedling process he did. Uh, he gave those, which would have been row M for Claypool, gave those to Donald Compton, and he still has those planted uh, in his orchard. And so you can walk that row and see and taste James Claypool's last breeding work. Um, and Claypool also gave Donald permission to name two of Donald's favorite cultivars of clay pools, um, which he calls Valine Beauty and Valine Queen. And they're both excellent cultivars. Um, Got to move on now to Jerry Lehman. Uh, Jerry Lehman is a man in Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, many people that are into pawpaws know about Jerry. Uh, he was equally into persimmons. Uh, he also uh, took great interest in the work of James Claypool and lived a lot closer to him. He's only about an hour from St. Elmo. Um, Jerry did a lot more of his work through the Indiana Nut and Fruit Growers Association. It, and um, he was highly involved with this, president of that for many years. And Lehman took many groups out to St. Elmo in the persimmon season to sample and try to make a comprehensive map of Claypool's orchard. And there's still a document, I think we have it in our files that we gave you, if not, Buzz and I both have it. It's a very big document, but it has a map of the location of every tree in Claypool's orchard, along with sort of scores on different qualities of the fruit to try and evaluate and find some of the best varieties. <clears throat> Lehman also planted at his own uh, farm a very large collection of grafted cultivars. He collected all, all over the place um, and also did some of his own crosses and breeding work. Uh, some of these of Jerry Lehman's that are uh, being propagated and sold today are Lehman's Delight, Barbara's Blush, Celebrity, Deer Magnet, Deer Candy. Now move on to Cliff England, Sand Gap, Kentucky sort of close to Berea for those of you, you that know um, Kentucky a little bit. Cliff England began a nursery focused on uncommon fruiting plants. And a large portion of this um, nursery was focused on persimmons. Uh, Cliff has the largest collection of persimmons hands down that we know of. Um, and he has also focused because he's a little bit warmer growing zone focused on um, the khaki, some khaki cultivars that might be Northern hardy and also hybrid persimmons of khaki Virginiana crosses. Um, one of the most powerful facets of this work is his partnership with the late David Laverne of Louisiana. David uh, was a man who worked mostly with crossing uh, Virginiana, Virginiana and khaki to create hybrid seedlings to trial. Laverne sent seeds from these crosses to Cliff, who was in a nor northern location to test their cold hardiness. And uh, what happened is Cliff now has a, an amazingly large orchard of David Laverne seedlings that he has seen come into fruition. Another interesting uh, thing that happened is in 2012, that winter had the polar vortex, this epic cold spell from the polar vortex event. And this was a true test of cold hardiness for Cliff's plantings. I forget what it got down to, but definitely below negative 20. And you got to see which cultivars died out and which ones survived. So the ones that showed no damage are now known to be very hardy and Cliff uh, continues to be amazed by the quality and diversity of fruits showing up as Laverne seedlings come into production. Some of these are being released, um, and two that are well known now are Cassandra and David's Candy, both hybrids. Uh, we believe Cliff will be releasing many more of these in the coming years, and we're excited to see uh, how these things uh, start coming out in different regions. Uh, 
Two other hybrids that Cliff was instrumental in distributing and becoming well known are JTO2, which is Makusu, which I think right here is JTO2, and NBO2. Right. And let's see. I'm going to, Buzz, I'm going to do uh, the two things and I'll let you talk about your hardiness thing before you at the end. I just wanted to say two more places besides Buzz who we're getting to. Um, Buzz is, uh, oh, yeah, Buzz will talk talking a little bit, but two other places, Indiana Fruit and Nut Growers Association, used to be Indiana Nut Growers Association, did and still does a lot to distribute the many improved cultivars of persimmons to many people interested in growing this fruit. Um, and then we all, there's a many other nurseries, breeders, and collectors that we know of, um, and they all, all of us are all interested in working together and promoting and evaluating and discovering this, all the things we have to see yet in this amazing fruit. Uh, we, gave, we put in the resources section a, a list of the breeders that we know of and nurseries and those sort of things. So check that out. And, I, and forgive us for any omissions of this because I mean, we tried to rack our brains for everybody we could think of, but I'm sure there's some we haven't heard about yet and some that we forgot. So sorry about that. All right, I'm gonna let Buzz talk a little about his, his uh, cold hardiness trials up in Chile, Vermont, um, seeing what we can be do doing with persimmons up there. So take it away, Buzz. Hey, Buzz, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Darren. Um, I want to loop back a little bit and just talk for a moment about um, a couple of the people we discussed briefly. There are still a, a whole bunch of persimmons trees that are alive and well and growing at Hershey Nursery, at both of his nurseries in Pennsylvania. Some of those may well be these old fashioned ones, um, uh, but there's no way to ID them. So it's a fabulous thing to see. And they're even against the nicest ones that are we're that we're harvesting today. They really hold their own, so they're very beautiful. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, which is why I knew about persimmons and pawpaws. Because growing up, I was so you know I saw them and was able to see them, um, and fell in love with them. Them with them then as a um, persimmons in particular have always been really really a plant, a, a fruit that I love. Um, and so when I moved to Vermont, I heard from pretty much everyone, there's no way persimmons will grow in zone four. And that was disheartening. <laughs> but I took that with a grain of salt because there is one. There's one plant called Meter. It was originally called New Hampshire One. Uh, and Elwin Meter, who was at the University of New Hampshire, he was, that was one of his last breeding experiments. He had a long career in plants uh, and fruit breeding. And, and I think it was in the late 60s, he grew 200 seed seedlings from the cultivar Garretson. And Garretson is a seedling of early golden. And from those 200 seed, he selected one, New Hampshire one, which is now called Meter. Uh, it is notoriously hardier than almost every other uh, persimmon that is grown. Um, and I, I figured if Meter could get one out of 200 seedlings, I should try something a little more extravagant and kind of piggybacking on Luther Burbank's work. I have planted out 10,000 seedlings over the last four years. And um, they are currently in, in evaluation, primarily for hardiness. Um, now, um, um, in the first four years now, I've kind of discovered that one in 100 is, is significantly hardier than the rest. Um, if at least half, or if, depending on who you talk to, somewhere between half and 75% of those humans are gonna be male. So <laughs> if I plant 10, if I get 10,000, uh, that'll be 100 to evaluate. I should get 40 or 50 that are female. So I'm hoping to leave behind, um, if I live long enough, a legacy of cold hardier selections. It's been very exciting to see um, if you look in the photographs, there's a whole section there on my cold hardiness project. And you can see there was a wicked cold freeze, 19 degrees on September 19th, um, year before last. And they're just, all my trees were still actively growing, almost all of them. All of them were still actively growing. And all of them were burnt black or brown, brown except for a very few, 
which showed little to no damage. So that was the first really good test, not even test winter, because I'm convinced that persimmons can handle 25 below. They just can't handle very well 19 degrees in September. And so that's the work I continue. And if any of you people are in zone four and want to be collaborators, make sure you get a hold of me. Zone four or colder. Let's really push it. <laughs> okay. Um, Darren, you have anything else you want to add about persimmons before we switch to pawpaw? Yeah, I just, I saw my slide here and remembered that I want to just say a brief mention about Eliza Greenman, who's just, those of you in the know, Eliza's work, um, heavy on apples, but she's got a lot of other stuff she's doing and amazing woman doing um, amazing stuff uh, with persimmons and many other species. So here's a picture of her showing off a khaki cultivar called Gaboshi or Smith's Best. So um, yeah. Uh, but as I go ahead and take it away, I, I think we're good. Keep moving on to Paul Paul's. Yes. So at this time, we're going to, we would love to spend another hour on persimmons, but <laughs> since this talk is about both, we're going to have to move on. So, Darren, why don't you pull up that first slide of, um, of Paw Paw in flower? There you go. So, Paw Paw flowers. So, Paw Paw is another amazing um, native plant. And it has had a in recent years, a meteoric rise in popularity, which is fantastic because it has a, had a long history of um, being not very well received or, or and unknown. So um, it is a species Asamina triloba. There are uh, many, many species of Asamina. And today we're only talking about triloba, which is the you know, common pawpaw. We all know American pawpaw. Uh, it is the largest edible North American fruit. Uh, has It is light green skinned, kidney-shaped fruits that weigh up to a pound and a half. It's not uncommon, actually, to get a pound and a half fruit these days as the um, cultivars get better and better. Uh, the flesh is um, soft and sweet when ripe, white to deep orange yellow in color, interrupted by two rows of large hard black seed. A wide spectrum of flavor from bitter and not very tasty. Uh, too mild and almost flavorless. Um, the texture ranges from thick and waxy to mushy and watery. Ripening time is highly seasonal. The varieties go from early to mid-fall. Uh, here in zone four, we, I'm off, often picking up the few pawpaws that are ready uh, in the snow. And, you know, our first two weeks in October. So it can get very late. Um, the flesh contains a significant amount of vitamin C, riboflavin, niacin, and all kinds of other minerals, as well as fat and protein. Also present are phytochemicals known as acetogens, which are subject of controversial debate as to whether they are neurotoxins and contribute to various uh, disease or are med medicinal and have potential to combat cancerous tumors. Uh, until more research is done, we suggest eating pawpaws in moderation and paying attention to your own body. Um, it is very delicious. And um, some people can eat huge volumes, no effect. Other people can only eat very little. Um, the range in habit. It's a common small tree found in woodlands uh, over most of the Eastern US, from Florida up to New York, west to Texas and Kansas. It grows clonally, forming vast networks of root suckers, which form vast colonies in the understory of the Eastern forest. It's not unusual to find entire acre or larger colonies that without a single fruit, um, we assume because they are all clones of the same plant and they cannot pollinize one another. Um, it does tolerate shade well. Um, it doesn't fruit well in deep shade. Uh, it's opportunistic species and waits patiently for an opening the canopy to suddenly shoot upwards and taking advantage of the sunlight when it can. When it can. Once it hits the mid-story, it fruits, it fruits much more heavily. Uh, and it also produced more stems in that, in, during that time. Uh, if you've never seen pawpaws in the woods, I encourage you to go and find them. They're the most interesting plant to see in their native habitat. Um, in cultivation, the most fruit production comes from full sun plantings, without a doubt. Many, many more, um, many, many more fruit come from full sun. 
Um, the idea that you cannot plant pawpaws in full sun, I believe to be specious. Pawpaws can't be moved from the shade or a shaded environment to the full sun once they have leafed out. Pawpaws that have been grown uh, in full sun uh, seem to tolerate full sun very well. Tiny baby pawpaws definitely appreciate some shade and protection um, because they're fragile and small. And so between the sun and the wind, it's hard on them. Hey, Buzz, I'm going to say something real quick. I think uh, Kirk Pomper and the Sherry Crabtree and those folks at Kentucky State University found that uh, seedlings need, I think, six weeks of shade and they can go right out into full sun after that from yes. their studies, at least. So, yeah, we're. Yeah. Uh, here, here in zone four, I don't baby my plants at all. They're grown in full sun. Um, I tried them both in the shade, semi shaded greenhouse and in full sun. They definitely do better. <laughs> in the semi-shade, um, but they will live and grow in full sun, fine. Um, uh, partial shade, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So utilizing seedlings, clonal plants from root cuttings and allowing suckers, root stocks to sucker out and grafting onto these as the original stem is dying are potential strategies to work with the natural habit of this tree and to renew via root suckers. Um, Root suckers move fairly well, in my experience. They just don't like to be moved fully dormant. If you wait till the buds are moving on root suckers to dig them, same thing with the trees. They seem to move. They seem to move and survive much more readily. Um, I think that's it for me, Darren. If you want to add to that at all, and then you can take it with the history of cultivation. Yeah, I think we're good. Um, all right. Sorry, everybody had to step out. Someone was knocking at the door here. All right. Well, we're going to talk now about the history, the people that have been involved in the breeding of cinnamon and triloba, the pawpaw. And as Buzz said earlier with persimmons, uh, American persimmon, we can't emphasize enough the work of indigenous plant scientists that have been around thousands of years before us on this continent. Um, on the improvement of this species. Uh, we believe the wide variety of shapes, colors, flavors, sizes of this fruit, they all seem to point to more highly purpose selection and planting of desirable genetics by pre-genocide uh, pre indigenous cultures. We are now working, all of us, you know, here and, and this time and place now, we are working to catch back up with their breeding projects um, that were neglected and destroyed for centuries. And as we get into this history, I do wanna uh, give credit. Uh, most of this work has already been collected and put in a really nice paper by Neil Peterson that was published in the journal Hort Technology, July through September of 2003. Um, we, have it, we have this in the resource file. So go check that out. If you want more details, we summarize this um but he pretty much found it all and you know we are just presenting it to you in an even more summarized form than he had it's called paw paw variety development a history and future prospects by r neil peterson all right so paw paw uh cultivation very similar time frame to persimmons began um well the european version <laughs> began in the early 1900s and just like persimmons, most of these were just superior selections from the wild. Um, and some selections maybe from that progeny, people saving seeds, planting them and finding what happens. Uh, the first known cultivar is one called Uncle Tom that was uh, selected by a man named Little. I had never found anything about his first name. He was in Danville, Indiana and um, Another guy named Benjamin, Buck, Benjamin Buckman in Farmingdale, Illinois, uh, had a collection of 12 named varieties, including uh, Uncle Tom, but he had some that he found and, and cultivated. Interesting side note is those of you that are into pears definitely have heard of the name Farmingdale with the old home of Farmingdale crosses. Uh, Benjamin Buckman was the source of the Farmingdale genetics of those crosses. So those were the first two major people that are at least written about, at least, uh, that were working with pawpaws and trying to collect and improve them. 
1916 brought a national contest for the best pawpaw. And this was organized by the American Genetics Association. So they were looking for, you know, they said, if we send a contest out, you know, surely we'll get some of the best genetics from all over the pawpaw's natural range. And we can work with some of those genetics. And sure enough, they got 75 entries. Um, side note, I remember hearing that, uh, uh, more details about that, so that a lot of the fruit, because, you know, the postal system back then was a little bit different than today. And um, pawpaws are pretty fragile to ship even today. So I think most of the fruit was complete mush by the time it got to Washington, D.C. And um, I always wonder, you know, how many even better cultivars than the best one were actually there, but they were just mush by the time they got to um, D.C. So but anyway, 75 entries resulted in a handful of what they called superior cultivars. And of all these, the, um, the contribution from um, Mrs. Ketter, Mrs. Ketter of Irontown, Ohio, got the award for best pawpaw in the United States. Um, and they, the cultivar of that is called Ketter after Mrs. Ketter. And so they, that's what, the, kind of that, we know about that for now. Next, uh, David Fairchild, um, had a farm near Chevy Chase, Maryland, and he grafted uh, trees of Ketter um, and also planted seedlings of Ketter on his farm. Uh, one of these seedlings was deemed superior to his parents, and uh, he called this one Fairchild um, after his, his own last name. Next, we get to George Zimmerman of Piketown, Pennsylvania. And in 1928, he took on some of the work of Fairchild and planted out a collection of 60 or more varieties. Zimmerman did uh, some controlled crosses um, in addition to his collection. He did some controlled crosses, including interspecific crosses. So he did some crosses. He was trying to cross pawpaw and chiramoya, tropical species, and atamoya, another tropical species. I don't think he ever got any success with those, but he got success with crossing some of the Asimina triloba with some of the southerly Florida species um, that are more, a little more tropical. Um, so he got some interspecific crosses and had them in his place. And those interspecific crosses actually uh, went on to the Blandy Experimental Farm in um, uh, Boyce, Virginia, which we'll talk about next here. I don't know if any of those were ever recovered. I know there's one three-way tropical cross that was floating around uh, Indiana fruit nut growers, but I have no idea the source of that one. So the Blandy Farm, um, let me see here. Okay, Blandy Farm was directed by a man named Orland E. White. And um, Mr. White amassed a wide range of cultivars and new material from across the natural range of the species. So we keep kind of building, you know, it's like, you know, these first few people get some stuff and then, you know, some of that gets lost, but then people kind of just keep building on each other's work, which is the beauty of all of this. Uh, records of the Blandy Farm were lost. Um, so we don't really don't know the details of these, uh, but many of these trees remained and kept growing and they end up being coming a large basis for Neil Peterson's work that we'll hear about in a bit in the 1980s. Uh, next, we get to John Hershey, who we heard about last time, and we'll be hearing a number of names from our previous section, because it seems like people that are attracted to one of these fruits are also attracted to the other. John Hershey of uh, Downingtown, Pennsylvania, worked with a number of pawpaw cultivars, and he mostly sold seedlings uh, to Jim Zimmerman's work. Um, H.A. Allard of Arlington, Virginia, collected and planted out cultivars and worked at crossing and selecting from them. Um, when the, he had, a, there's an agricultural research station farm there. Um, a few other scattered players in the pawpaw breeding found good selections from the wild, including one called Sweet Alice, uh, it was from Homer Jacobs. And I think Buzz is gonna take it away now to the like slightly newer phase. Yeah, so we move in now to the mid 1990s. 
excuse me, 1900s. Um, uh, and there was a significant push in the Northern Nut Growers Association uh, to help bring the pawpaw uh, forward and to create better um, varieties, cultivars. And so uh, through collection and breeding work, both, uh, they st you started to see introductions of uh, the cultivars, which we we know today. Um, Overlease came out in the mid uh, 1900s. Uh, it was a chance seedling in Rushville, Indiana, discovered by a man named W.B. Ward. Milo Gibson found the important cultivar, a sunflower, in Kansas, and brought it to the wide, to the wider world. Uh, sunflower is interesting in that it is self fertile. Um, I've seen that here in Vermont, in more than one location. Um, it's also quite hardy in Vermont. I believe others will be, but sunflower, for some reason, sunflower seedlings were grown by a, five, a zone five uh, grower here and have been widely set, uh, spread around the state. So we see sunflower single plants here that do produce pawpaws. Um, Corwin Davis of Bellevue, Michigan, devoted himself to collecting superior genetics from the wild in Michigan and growing and selling them from his nursery. Uh, Davis, Taylor, and Tatu are some of these. Um, these uh, Taylor and Tatu are also fairly early and uh, fruiting and quite hardy here in Vermont as well. He later crossed them and selected uh, the superior seedlings, Lynn, Lynn's favorite, IXL and Tollgate. Um, in the, probably in the 60s, 1960s, maybe a little bit later, John Gordon, again, we've heard, we heard about John Gordon with persimmons, um, started planting out seed collected from Zimmerman, uh, selected from Zimmerman site by George Slate, a somewhat famous grower <laughs> uh, who was at Cornell. Um, Gordon selected a handful of early ripening varieties uh, that would, would ripen in, in zone five uh, in Amherst, New York, which is right near Buffalo. These are PA Golden, a series PA Golden one, two, three, and four. He also selected SAA Zimmerman and then three seedlings of overlease, SAA, SAB, and SAC overlease. Um, uh, right across the Canadian border, Doug Campbell also worked closely with John Gordon on pawpaws and other things. And from, uh, he selected a seedling called NC1, uh, which is a, was a seedling of Davis. Um, we move up into the eighties and enter Neil Peterson. And there he is, a younger Neil Peterson, <laughs> in the middle of his work, as Darren says there, Neil, Neil Peterson began to track down and collect the germplasm from as many of the sources, remnants, that he could find. Using material from the Blandy Research Station, from John Hershey's, from Buckman's, and from Zimmerman, uh, he joined up with the University of Maryland and planted out 1,483 seedlings at the Y Farm, W-Y-E Farm, in um, Queenstown in, and, Key, and at Keatesville, Maryland. And those were, the, he, he grew those out for a period of time. And in 1994, uh, he was able to select 18 superior selections from this original planting. And he worked with 12 universities around the country, the East Coast anyway, to establish identical controlled regional variety trials. He also sold pawpaw fruit and trees at the farmer's market uh, in Washington, DC, tirelessly educating the public on the fantasticness of uh, pawpaw. He was able to gain ideas of what the public liked through that work of actually sh tasting and showing people cultivars. Peterson acquired trademark names and pa plant patents for three of his favorite for his cultivars. Uh, originally, they were Shenandoah, Susquehanna, and Rappahannock. All of Peterson's releases are named after famous American rivers. Subsequently, he released Allegheny, Wabash, and Potomac. Um, and just a few years ago, he added Tallahatchie to that list. Tallahatchie is especially interesting to me because it's an early ripening. It's the most early ripening of his seven varieties. Uh, 
all of these plants continue to be among the best known and sought after cultivars of pawpaw. Um, Darren, you're gonna you're gonna go from 1990 forward. Right, pass the baton on. We're gonna keep rolling here, keep running. So we're gonna uh, move forward a little bit here around the same time, 1990. Um, brought actually, uh, 1990 brought a new pawpaw contest, like the one that was from 1916. Uh, this one was conducted through Kentucky State University, and it was headed up by Brett Calloway. 400, over 400 entries from all over the natural range of pawpaw were sent in. And the winner of this was a cultivar called Wells from David Wells family in Salem, Indiana, which happens to be just 20 minutes to the east of us. And just a uh, conversation with Don, Donald Compton, uh, knew David Wells and um, knew the property of where these trees were growing, the Wells trees, and they've they're gone. They've been cut down by new owners, unfortunately. Um, so I'd say, in my opinion, better than the entries from this, um, to you know, better than finding the best pawpaw in this contest was the influx of new material. Um, oh, better than the influx of this new material, which is great, was the formation of a solid university program to study and work on breeding improvements of it's him in a triloba, which is Kentucky State University. Uh, the, work here, the work at Kentucky State University has steadily built over the years since and has become the USDA National Clonal Germplasm Repository site for pawpaws in 1994. So they are the site there um, that has the most genetic um, bank of uh, pawpaw um, germplasm in the US. Uh, Brett Calloway uh, led this program for the first three years at KSU. Um, he was succeeded by Desmond Lane. And finally, in 1988, 1998, the current director, who's still there, uh, Dr. Kirk Pomper, took over. Um, and I want to say something here, too, that um, um, I think in the beginning of Kirk Pomper's um, tenure there, uh, a woman named Snake, Snake Jones was uh, key to helping Dr. Pomper uh, in his research and getting the Paul Paul program moving forward. And currently, a woman named Sherry Crabtree um, is is has been there for a long time and took over from Snake Jones's uh, work, and she has been key in all the work happening at Kentucky State University and a great person to work with. Uh, um, I'm a licensed prop. We're licensed propagators for Kentucky State varieties, and um, I'm working mostly with Sherry, and she's a wonderful person to work with. So I uh, can't say enough, enough good things about um, those two women that are in the Paul Paul breeding world. Uh, so more on Kentucky State. Uh, Kentucky State has has uh, led the way in a lot of ways with more detailed research studies on many different facets of and pawpaw fruit. Uh, they've been doing a lot of studies on the fruit quality, um, on, on genetics, like using genetic markers and more genetic hard research to find what's going on with the pawpaw genetics, and also with growing methods. Like earlier I mentioned, they kind of figured out a, more of a specific thing about how long pawpaws need to be in shade after they germinate before they can put in full sun. Um, I know they also did an uh, interesting um, uh, rootstock trial where they put different cultivars on two different seedlings of uh, two different um, seedlings of two different cultivars. Um, well, I forget. No, they had two different cultivars. They used sunflower and Susquehanna, I believe. There, that block of trees, I think, is still there. Um, but they put them on different seedlings uh, rootstock to see if there's any difference in production. I'm not sure what result of that was, but uh, pretty interesting stuff. I know they're also, I think, still maybe involved or we're doing, uh, one person was involved in um, doing a study on, on self-pollination, self-fertile pawpaws uh, to study and see how that actually is working and how much, um, how much uh, we can see in that, how, how widely distributed that is. So KSU has led the way here, um, but they've also come up with in their work three um, of their favorite selections that they think are worthy of being in the nursery trade. 
Uh, these are patented and trademark cultivars released by KSU, and they all start with KSU to demark where they're from. Uh, first one was KSU Atwood, second is KSU Benson, and the third is KSU Chappelle. And these are all named after, um, I think, previous presidents of Kentucky State University, um, which is kind of neat, their, their name and um, keeping legacy of some people alive there by naming the Paul Paul cultivars out of them. Uh, Neil Peterson has collaborated with Kentucky State Universities all along, and um, there is a block of specific crosses made by Peterson um, out of his best cultivars um, in the KSU orchard. They also have one of the regional variety trials that Bud had talked about earlier there at KSU. I've walked through that a number of times. Uh, so another, uh, we talked about the KSU uh, contest. We just have to make mention that there was a second contest in 1990 for Paul Pauls that um, I sort of tried to happen. Um, it was led by a man named Mark Blossom of Eureka Springs, Arkansas. But um, due to some unfortunate events, I think uh, none of the results of this contest were uh, recorded or kept much of and pretty much lost the time now. Um, Okay, and now we're moving a little forward to Jerry, oh, Jerry Lehman. Hold on, what's going on here? There we go. Jerry Lehman he happens to be standing there uh, in a grove of bananas, true bananas, not Indiana bananas. Uh, this is at University of Georgia, and some of their uh, banana work in the field there. Uh, the late Jerry Lehman of Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, was very active in collecting and, and evaluating and breeding pawpaws, uh, both at his home farm um, in Terre Haute and also through Indiana fruit and nut growers. Uh, Lehman did many intentional crosses between cultivars and planted out the resulting seedlings for trials. Uh, one un very, very unique facet of his breeding work is the use of a cultivar called Sam Norris 15. Three more minutes, Darren. Oh, thank you. Um, right here we see Doug Fell, who was a friend of Jerry's with Sam Norris 15. I'm gonna just say briefly here, Sam Norris 15 was a mutated selection of a guy made, um, Sam Norris made with colchicine. And um, we think that these are maybe like some kind of multiploidy thing, but Jerry figured out how to work with these things and it's in most of his favorite Paul Pauls. Let me keep moving here. So, um, some of uh, Jerry Lehman's um, best pawpaws that are out there that he's put out to the world are Jerry's Big Girl, Lehman's Delight, Benny's Favorite, and Maria's Joy. All excellent selections. Uh, talk again about Cliff England. Uh, we talked about him last time. He also has an impressive collection of pawpaws from around the world. Um, he still sells cyanwood from these. Uh, Cliff is an incredible networker and has planted out many uh, Grafted cultivars and also crosses and seedlings on his farm. Uh, Summer Delight is one he's released, I think, from his own work. Uh, that is an extremely early, it's the earliest pawpaw, I think, known to ripen early. Um, he also brought varieties like Naomi's Delicious, Kentucky Mammoth, Kentucky Champion, Halvin Sidewinder, and um, some potential freestone cultivars uh, where the uh, fruit doesn't cling to the seed uh, onto the scene. Uh, and a quick mention to Ron and the late Terry Powell of Fox Paul Ridge near Aberdeen, Ohio. Um, Ron and Terry spearheaded the Ohio Pawpaw Growers Association, um, in addition to being planting an impressive number of cultivars for trial uh, at their farm outside of um, Cincinnati. They're also active in the North American Pawpaw Growers Association. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this by the, for the time. I'll cut it off, but basically I mentioned to the Ohio Pawpaw Festival that started in 1997 in outside of Athens, Ohio, and it can continue to this day and it's grown tremendously. Um, and um, yeah, Kentucky State University has also hosted two international pawpaw conferences at their site in um, at Frankfort, Kentucky. Um, I was at the second one um, a few years ago and met a lot of great people. And the purpose of that is bringing people from around the world uh, to, to network and share and cross-pollinate um, about the work of breeding and growing pawpaws. 
And I think that is all the time we have. Um, I don't know if Chris has some time for questions or not, but I'll let you. Uh, Thanks, Jerry. Away. Yeah, there's always there's always uh, not enough time. Never enough time. But, yeah. Oh, oh, I forgot that the, there was one more slide. Can I share the screen again? One more well, important we got, slide. We guys. OK, yeah, go go ahead. But there's a really important slide at the end there that um, I really need to show you guys here. So, <laughs> OK, there's a few more there. There's Kentucky, there's Kentucky State, uh, Don Compton. And then this is a very important thing about the Zors. We need to talk a little bit about the Zors, which are um, things that happen when you eat things that are indigestible. And here's some of the most amazing bazaar collection I know of, a man named Lucky Pittman, who's an amazing nut grower and fruit grower in Hodgkinville, Kentucky. Uh, he was kind enough to share pictures of his bazaar collection um, with me and uh, just had to show those, bring those up here. Sort of a, Thanks, Derek. Thanks, sort of Derek. A, yeah, so bazaars are, um, that's that's the real work we need to do is cultivate <laughs> more bazaars in the world. Land, land pearls. It means, means we're uh, eating our persimmons, right? All right. Oh, yeah. You can take away the screen now. <laughs> uh, so uh, Eric, Eric is the co-host, and uh, we're going to be working together on some questions. Eric, are there any that you want to start with? Well, uh, we don't seem to have a lot of pawpaw questions, so let's start in the persimmon ones, and hopefully people can add some pawpaw ones while we're answering them. So, yeah. Uh, how, about, here... how about the admin one? Sure. Um, so they noted that... Uh, Smaller, darker persimmons have a richer, spicier taste than the larger, light ones, and everyone seems to be breeding uh, the larger, light ones unless there's any effort to preserve or develop the smaller ones. Um, Darren, there was, uh, if you if you remember, there is uh, there's another question about about a similar a similar question, but uh, if you can talk about bread roll and bread winner. Because those are those are smaller, denser, darker ones, and That's they, have, right. they seem to have a different flavor than the the larger, light orange ones. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a cultivar floating around called Bread Roll, <laughs> um, and if you see that one, that that's a uh, that's a little secret one that. Chris Hemanix and I uh, snuck out to the world. So it's it's um, from Jerry Layman's orchard. Um, it's a cultivar that seems to have really dense, starchy fruit um and just an interesting anomaly that would be kind of fun to work with that might be more to point with what the uh, uh person who put the question in has to say but as, other than that i don't know of anybody focusing on the smaller darker ones specifically um i know i mean like the date plum lotus has extremely sweet small fruits and i don't know if anybody i know i really don't know what the ploidy level is on on Lotus, if it can be crossed with Virginiana or khaki or not. I don't know, you guys know anything about that? There's Lotus khaki hybrids, oh, but there. I don't think they've got very far with it. Yeah. yeah. But Chris, Chris, I have a comment here. So the, you wanna... uh, can you hear me? Yeah, go for it. So um, a lot of the breeders, well, Donald Compton, we'll take him for example. When we tour his orchard, uh, some of the things, some of the work that we think is really good, um, Donald poo poos because he is focused on pulp. He wants to get as many persimmons as quickly up off the ground and turn them into pulp because that's part of his livelihood. So he also sees that as a way for persimmons to move forward. So some stuff we see that's amazing. He's like, yeah, that's that's nothing. That's no good. So he also has all kinds of different densities and uh, he'll say that fruit has too many black specks. And when we were, when I was there just the one time with you fellas, it was like, Oh my gosh, what's this one? Oh my gosh, what's this one? He's like, yeah, that's no good. So the focus of the breeders is not necessarily uh, what with the general public or, or the whole thing with persimmons is that it's evolving. So we need, we need people who want to focus on the small dark meaty ones to start collecting them because they're definitely there. They just haven't been assembled. Hmm. I'll say one other thing if we've got a second um, right off springboarding off what Buzz said is I, I think I know there are some people that are starting to select uh, more for livestock feed and some of the most important ones for livestock feed are the ones that hang on the tree through the entire winter uh, anybody that's been in the persimmon natural growth area knows that they're just trees that 
individual trees that hang on to the persimmons, they never really fall. Um, and they just hang on there all winter. And sometimes they fall in March, February. Uh, and these are important ones for giving a uh, nice source of carbohydrates to livestock throughout the winter. Um, so I think, yes, yeah, like Buzz said, it's just, we all need to be focusing on the different facets and strengths of different parts of this fruit. Um, I'm, I'm just going to weave these in here. Brett Anderson says, wow, 10,000 persimmon seedlings. Uh, what does the what does that look like spacing wise? And weave that in with, um, you know, uh, Mark Wolbers, which he says, um, good to hear about the work to improve hardiness. Any work to combine those attributes with short season varieties to enable growing in more northern locales? And so, what does the spacing look like as you're doing this work, Buzz? And so, talk I, about I that did, work. Yeah. I did share in the resources file, there's a, there's a whole, the resources section, there's a whole file on um, this hardiness project that shows photographs, one year seedlings, two year seedlings, three year seedlings, how the spacing looks. Um, typically at the end of three years, sometimes four years, um, I then take those plants and spread them out into nursery rows, the ones I'm selecting for going on. So they're planted very densely. And besides hardiness, I'm also looking for vigor. So I, a lot of seedlings get planted quite, quite close here in seed beds and then fluffed out over time. And the top 50% is used, uh, you know, easy to use for uh, either for lining out as rootstock, or excuse me, lining out as, as selections to grow on, um, using for rootstock and sold. Uh, the bottom 50% of, of almost all the seedlings that I grow, I grow um, end up going over the bank or to the hippies to grow out. You know, do do a, literally they take them all the stuff I don't want to plant or don't have any use for, and they gorilla plant them on their farms or whatever to see what they get. I'm happy for that, uh, but I only want that top half. Now, as far as varieties that will ripen early, I love getting frozen persimmons all winter long that are spectacular. Darren actually mails to me in Christmas time frozen um, Nikita's gift, and that I keep in the freezer here and eat one a day or one every other day for a couple of weeks until they're gone, because there's nothing better than a ripe persimmon that has hung on and has frozen and has become more and more and more and more sweet. The flavors of persimmons just open, hanging on the tree late. Um, having said that, I usually do select for my trials, probably 75 or 80% of the earliest drops, the earliest dropping varieties from Donald and Jerry and other places that will um, sell me seed other orchards that I know of. And just for that reason, because I would also like to have, um, you know, persimmons that are on the ground for pulping um, and not in the snow. I hope that answers the question. Real, real, real quick, yeah. as, you, as you go to the next time, I'm going to just be eating, I'm going to be eating some persimmons I have here. This is a Rosianca hybrid. So go ahead. I'll just eat this in the background. Um, <laughs> so there was a, just a question about the, uh, of course, there's always the confusion with the name Pawpaw and papaya and some places calling papaya pawpaw and that, you know, there are many names, indigenous names for pawpaw, including words that kind of sound like pawpaw and the Latin binomial. So if you guys could maybe speak to some of the, the many, many names that people call this fruit and call this fruit. Hey, Darren, I'm gonna let you jump on that first. I gotta jump up, I got something happening here. I gotta deal with, I apologize folks. Hey, no problem, sounds good. I'll, um, what I've heard on that is that possibly uh, uh, when Europeans came to the U.S. Um, and found the and saw what was growing here and saw it was a good fruit, that they just used the term they already had for this other fruit that they had been involved with in all their colonial uh, activities in the tropical regions called a pawpaw um, for a papaya, and they just said, oh, this is this tropical standing fruit, we'll call it papaya. I mean, call it pawpaw, just like this other one. Um, I don't really know much more than that. Um, that that's okay. Uh, here, here's just a basic question. Ellen asks, best varieties for beginning pawpaw growers? Um, I would say, I mean, it's somewhat well known. Um, I don't know if anybody has actually done trials, but the variety mango 
is supposed to be a, a very fast growing variety that's a really vigorous scion. Um, I would say that, you know, my opinion that you would have to have an equally nicely growing root system on that to be grafted onto for that uh, top variety to actually achieve its potential. But um, a lot of people have kind of noted anecdotally that mango is a really vigorous cultivar. Um, I know some people have noticed some, some varieties are really slow and dinky and don't seem to grow well. I really don't know how much, you know, truth there is to some of that, um, how much anecdotal. But um, as far as the cultivars, the, the big question I'd say is for pawpaw newbie that's never eaten pawpaw fruit before, I would personally recommend starting out with more, much more mild flavored varieties like Shenandoah, mango is pretty mild flavored. Um, KSU Atwood and Chappelle are very mild flavored. And if you really like those, and you, or if you try wild pawpaws and you love that real, some people say it's bitter, some people say it's like a burnt caramel flavor, then you might want to try some of the stronger tasting cultivars like KSU Benson, which is, has a nice caramely deep flavor, but some people really don't like that. So um, I'd say the most important thing besides cultivars, just making sure you really take care of those little pawpaws you're planting, give them lots of mulch, um, keep weeds away from them. They really, really don't like to grow in sod or, or weeds, so. I have something to add. Yeah. So first off, back to the pawpaw papaya thing. So common names, no matter whether it's native plants, woody plants, whatever it is, common names are always like that. You're always gonna have confusion. So the, the more you can use Latin binomials, when you're actually talking about plants, uh, the better it is for everyone who's trying to really get to the heart of the matter of what is what. Um, as far as first time growing um, pawpaw, it, you may want to consider growing a seedling from someone who's growing seed of, ooh, look at that persimmon, from someone who's growing seed from really good selections. Um, seedling pawpaws from very, from nice, from good cultivars often make very good plants themselves and it's far less investment um, the graft won't die, is less likely to die. Um, and if you're just learning how to grow these plants, uh, you can start with them and then add grafted cultivars once you feel comfortable and it won't be quite so painful if you lose them. And I'm gonna, cool. I'm gonna be cutting up another one, Ichi Kike Jiro. This is a non-astringent uh, khaki cultivar that we have outside our front door. So go ahead, Chris. Just, uh, just uh, time for one more question. What do you, what do you think, Eric? Uh, well, he mentioned the astringency thing, so we could ask the astringency question. Um, Eris asked, uh, do all breeders look at astringency in persimmons as a negative attribute, or are there some benefits in keeping astringency in a selection? What do you guys think? As far as I know, um, the non-astringent types, um, when they ripen to a soft, uh, soft version, they're just not that flavorful. They're not that... So I think that with khaki, at least, the, um, the, the astringent types are ones that have just selected for just incredible flavor when they're ripe, but they've got to be ripe. And the non-astringent, I think, are just a total, in some ways, a totally different fruit. Like right here, you can't slice most persimmons, <laughs> but there it is, like an apple. And it's crunchy, delicious, but a very light, sweet, not much persimmon flavor, very light. I love them, but in a very different way than a gooey, you know, gooey Rosianka right here. That's just like, just goo. There's no way you can slice that. <laughs> the best of both, both species, really. Right. Um, maybe one last one here. Uh, so Glenn Laufer asks, uh, what varieties of Virginiana yeah. have the longest hanging window? Also, which varieties keep the best? I would imagine those are the ones that uh, hang on the tree all, all winter, but what do you guys think? That's a, that's a Darren answer, all I'm right. afraid. Yeah. So there's one, there's one variety that I found in Claypool's orchard when I collected cyanwood in uh, February this year. It was loaded with fruit and the ground was like a big orange smear underneath of it. And it was, a, it was one of uh, Claypool's original seedling trees that had died and was replaced with a graft. And the tag on the graft read Gayron's Seedless, G-E-H-R-O-N apostrophe huh. F, Seedless. And it was a seedless type. So we're thinking it's a 60 chromosome, but 
I was amazed at how productive it was and how late those fruits were hanging on. Um, so there's a guy named um, um, Austin uh, Unruh in Pennsylvania who is focusing a lot on livestock side of things. And he is really interested in late hanging persimmons for livestock feed. So he might be a good guy to talk to about what he's found out there. Anything to add, you guys? Or he, Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad I have that gay runs. See this? I did. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad you got it too. Yeah, well, dinky wood, dinky wood on that thing. There was nothing bigger than a thread. But I, there's um, for instance, there's a, a meter seedling that they just cut down at UVM, which breaks my heart and triggers my PTSD. But um, those fruit would hang on that tree until Christmas beyond. And um, give it a shake, get a bunch down. They were delicious, you know. So uh, I think they're probably a bunch. I know when when um, uh, almost all the ones that Hershey's drop before that, that, he doesn't have many that hang on for a long, long time. But I know there's a bunch of Donalds. And I know in the pictures of uh, Claypools, there are some um, that are hanging besides that gay Rons. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one in row two there that, you know, I've talked to you about already. And so they have never really been also have never been accumulated. Uh, no, one's, no one's made that the area, the real area of study, like which ones uh, will hang on forever and ever. Although when you read Hershey or uh, Russ Smith, they talk about the persimmons hanging on into January and feeding the, feeding the, feeding the animals uh, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Let's let's eke one more in. Um, <laughs> this is a personal pet peeve of mine, but... The, there's the kerfuffle around uh, cetogenins and pawpaw, oh my gosh. and uh, I, I think it's a much ado about nothing, but some people disagree. Um, I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? Yeah, I think, I think it's, I think there's a lot to be discovered about it yet. I mean, I think a lot of the same compounds that are deemed, said to be neurotoxins and possible precursors to Parkinson's. Um, I think those same compounds are the ones that they were studying to see if they were anti-tumor. Um, yeah. So it's like one of those things, you know, medicine, poison and medicine sometimes can be a fine line. But I, the one thing that gets me about it is that everybody I know that has been growing pawpaws for a while, and, and I'm, I'm one of them, I used to be so excited about pawpaws and I could just eat a ton of them. And every year that goes by, I find myself, if I'm honest, I don't really want to eat very many. I might want to eat one day, maybe one a week. I'm just like, well, they're cool, but I just, my body does not feel like a pawpaw anymore. And that's something that I think that's got, there's gotta be something to that. If, if, if everybody I know that's into pawpaws is kind of having that happen, I don't know. Maybe, I'm, maybe that's not totally true. I don't know. If yeah, I'm going to talk to the other side of that a little even though from the get-go, as Darren can tell you, I have never been a fan of strong flavored pawpaw, although I really like Al Horn or the, the white one and those, the mild ones, they're very good. My son, Bo, could eat pawpaws every day. He loves them and that hasn't stopped with him. And there are plenty of people who just love to consume pawpaw and it has no, their bodies feel like pawpaw, yep. pawpaws. So, you know, I'm, I'm nuts about persimmons. I like pawpaws, mm -hmm. but persimmons drive me nuts. I love those things. I could eat them till I'm out of my mind and sick. Um, and it's just, the, it's what my body really craves. I think it's individual. And I think, mm -hmm. I think, as you said in the beginning, there's the jury still out on how this is all going to go. Mm -hmm. And um, we should wait. I want to wait and see, because it could right. be just a, a matter of, you know, personal preference is all it boils down to. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think it's I think uh, most humans have never been selected for soursop, atomoya, pawpaw. And uh, so there's different susceptibility or the compatibility with the plant. And uh, it seems like it's a, such a nutritive food and it has such great anti-cancer properties and amino acid mm -hmm. profiles that it at least makes sense to eat it a little bit a year. Mm -hmm. They're probably not making it staple all year round um, but unless we crack how the Cherokee people like dried pawpaw successfully and rehydrated without getting sick yeah. that might be the key to cracking it i don't know mm -hmm. but i gotta i gotta transition yep. and um and thank you all for coming today um getting you know we never have enough time do we um but uh i, I want to let people know that um they've really populated a ton of really great content 
into the Google Drive um, and members have access to that and should really dig through the archive. It's a literal archive. Uh, there's a bunch of other archives like Max has put a huge archive up about Hershey Nursery. So go, go and there's a bunch of other stuff. So go check that out. Um, and uh, I just also wanted to say that um, uh, don't forget that coming up in just a couple hours um, is our keynote speaker and uh, it should be a real awesome time. So don't miss it. And I thank everybody on behalf of NAFEX uh, for coming and checking out this session and for checking out uh, all the sessions. And um, I think it's been a really fun time today. So thanks guys. Thanks everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. And I hope to talk to all of you at some point. Right. Take good care. <laughs>